Digimon Adventure opens with a prologue explaining that the Earth has been experiencing a lot of unusual weather lately. The cause of this is, as of yet, unknown. But at this point in time, the weather serves as an omen for things yet to come. The show's protagonists are introduced a bit later, seven children who were on a summer field trip in the mountains of Japan. The children are introduced to us in succession as Taichi Yagami, Yamada Ishida, Sora Takanuchi, Koshiro Izumi, Mimi Tachikawa, Jo Kido, and Takeru Takaishi. Additionally, there will be an eighth child who joins them much later into the show, Taichi's sister Hikari. Although the American show took to calling these children the Digi-Destined, I've stuck with calling them by their Japanese title, Erabarashi Kodomodachi, and I continually refer to them as Chosen Children. So the unusual weather has caused an atypical heavy snowfall to occur in the area where the children were camping, forcing everyone to take shelter. After the snow, the children decide to go out and play, when all of a sudden a strange light appears in the sky, and several objects fall from it, sinking into the snow. The objects then magically rise from their impacts, revealing themselves to be electronic devices. As we'll discover later, these objects are holy relics, called digivices. Note that they're almost identical to the toys that Bandai produced in the late 1990s. To show how dated the show is, Koshiro notes that the devices are neither cell phones nor pagers. And it's true, pagers were still being used during the late 1990s, but they were slowly becoming outdated. We'll see some similar references made to outdated technology in Episode 2 as well. Before the children are allowed to make a thorough inspection of these strange devices, a giant portal opens before them, appearing like a tidal wave, and they're swept up into it. This portal transports them to a strange new world, where they're immediately welcomed by a number of denizens that inhabit it. These are the digital monsters, the Digimon. The children's initial reaction to arriving in this strange new world and being greeted by such eldritch creatures is downplayed a bit, but that's mostly due to the tone of the show being made for a much younger audience. In other words, one would assume the children would be far more afraid of these monsters, like what happens in Stranger Things, but that's not how monsters are depicted in Digimon Adventure. That being said, the children don't at all treat their initial encounter with any levity at first, and something else worth remarking on here is that the eldest of the bunch, Joe, is the most fearful, while the youngest, Takeru, isn't afraid at all. So the fact that Joe is older means he's a bit more overwhelmed by this new world and the monsters therein, whereas Takeru is younger, and therefore one would assume he's more accepting. Throughout Digimon Adventure, almost every time a new Digimon is introduced, they're featured in a separate frame called the Digimon Analyzer. At first, the Digimon Analyzer seems like a fourth wall break, where a narrator gives a few details to the audience about the Digimon being featured by it. Later in the show, this analyzer is turned into an actual program on Koshiro's computer. So the Digimon Analyzer becomes a tool used by Koshiro, and therefore becomes a more immersive part of the show. This is an odd way to set things up. What would have been better would be to either have Koshiro discover this program in Episode 5 and download it, or maybe have the Digivices themselves come with this program installed beforehand, and create a holographic HUD like we see in Digimon Tamers. Before they've a chance to get their bearings, the children are attacked by a gigantic red beetle named Kuagamon. There doesn't seem to be any reason for its attacking them other than Kuagamon is just like that. Now the Digimon Analyzer reveals that Kuagamon is a virus-type Digimon, and that might better explain his pissy mood here. As it continues to chase the children, Kuagamon forces them and their Digimon partners to the edge of a cliff. Fortunately for the children, they've not been left defenseless in their current situation. A link has been established between each child and a respective Digimon that they'd met upon their arrival. Through this link, these partner Digimon are able to evolve into much stronger creatures. Now while the show seems to establish a base set of rules for how this all works, owing to the mechanics of the virtual pet upon which they are based, later on we'll see these rules bent, and perhaps even broken for the sake of the plot. It is one of the weaker aspects of Digimon Adventure, as far as consistency is concerned, and it's something I found hard to ignore on further viewings. I'll explain more about what I mean as I continue. So even after the partner Digimon evolve and light Kuagamon on fire, it returns with a vengeance, forcing them from the edge of the cliff. As this event leads directly into Episode 2, I suppose one could say that Episode 1 ends on a cliffhanger ending. Literally. Episode 2 begins, and Gomamon, Joe's Digimon partner, commands the fish in the waters to break their fall. Kuagamon also plummets into the water, presumably to his death, 
and he causes a huge wave to push the children farther down the river, to a position of safety. Although Episode 1 is the beginning of the show as a whole, Episode 2 is the beginning of Digimon Adventure's first story arc. You see, there are four major story arcs in Digimon Adventure, the first spanning Episodes 2 through 13, the second spanning Episodes 14 through 20, the third spanning Episodes 29 through 39, and the fourth arc spanning Episodes 40 through 52. These story arcs have not been arbitrarily assigned by any means. I've just separated parts of the show this way based on their thematic elements, in addition to the protagonists dealing with and overcoming some greater conflict. Now what do I mean when I say thematic elements? I'll endeavor to explain. So episode 1 begins with the children being launched into a portal to the digital world, and it's animated to look like they're cascading between two waterfalls. Then episode 2 begins with the children being forced down a river, on a raft made of fishes, and later on the episode features a fight near the ocean. Then you begin your next story arc with episode 14, and episode 14 begins with the children building a raft and sailing across the ocean. Then episode 29 begins the next story arc, where the children jump through the digital gate once again. So what we're seeing here is that whenever a new story arc gets underway, the show depicts the children being tossed into and arising from water. Moreover, the fourth story arc begins with the chosen children struggling against the Dark Masters, beginning with Metal Seedramon, who is the master of the digital world's oceans. And another thing that one should take note of here is that the first story arc takes place on an island, File Island a place completely surrounded by water. Whereas the second story arc takes place on the server continent, where the children are no longer surrounded by water, but rather they're wandering about a desert. Then the third story arc features the children returning home and fighting a new enemy amidst a city. Now the fourth story arc is somewhat of a repeat of the previous three, albeit in microcosmic fashion. The children fight new enemies by progressing through the digital world's major domains, namely water, land, and city. Now, I do realize that there's a fourth domain, but I'd rather not get into that here. Instead, I'll leave it for when I talk specifically about the Dark Masters and the fourth story arc. For now, I'm going to get off this tangent and get back into episode two. Having escaped from Kuwagama, the children have a moment to breathe and recollect themselves, and they attempt to figure out just what it is they ought to do next. They take this time to get to know their Digimon partners properly, since their previous introductions were cut short. On repeat viewings of Digimon Adventure, I've come to better appreciate these interactions as they better establish the Digimon partners as characters as they bond with the children. However, we don't get to see too much of that later on, save one or two of the partners who get some interesting moments to shine more than the others do. Gomamon, for instance, stands out because his personality contrasts so vividly with that of Joe, whom he's been partnered with. But overall, Digimon Adventure pins most of its character development on the human characters rather than their Digimon partners. This differs greatly from Digimon Tamers, which featured a much smaller group of children and was better able to explore the nuances of those children and their Digimon partners at the same time. Among the ongoing conversations, there's this claim that both Agumon and Tentamon make about how only Digimon exist within the digital world. I'll explain why this is a strange thing for them to say as I get into Episode 3. The children wander until they reach the ocean. They start running towards the beach after they hear the sound of ringing telephones in that direction. To their surprise, when they reach the edge of the ocean, they discover a line of telephone booths. Eagerly, they attempt to use the phones to call their families, but to no avail. All they receive in return is an operator's voice giving them random information, without actually connecting their calls. So in the digital world, technology seems to exist more as a natural aspect, alongside land and water. In other words, one might as well assume that these phone booths just grew there over a period of time, same as the trees of the forest. Naturally, the children had flocked to this technology because they recognized it as being something man-made, and therefore serving a specific function according to its design. The same thing goes for the trolley in Episode 3, and the factory in Episode 5. All technology that functions, but doesn't seem to serve any particular purpose. All in all, it makes the digital world that much weirder and disconcerting, and the Digimon themselves are equally strange in their biological makeup as evidenced when the children are eaten by Waymon in episode 14, and Waymon's stomach looks and functions more like the inside of a machine than an actual stomach. So when they realize the phones won't work for them, the children begin to reassess their situation, and they decide to get something to eat. Joe makes an attempt to divvy out their food supply, but he's stymied by Taichi, who selfishly shares a portion of the rations with his Digimon partner, Agumon. Although Joe becomes upset with Taichi, this turns out to be quite fortunate for the rest of them, as they are soon attacked by a sea-dwelling Digimon named Shelmon. Apparently, Shelmon doesn't take too kindly to strangers wandering about his beach. 
The partner Digimon attempt to defend the children as they had done before against Kuagama, but alas, they find themselves unable to this time, since they weren't given any food. However, because Taichi fed Agumon, Agumon is the only Digimon partner with enough strength to fight back, and so he gives it his best effort. However, the fight turns out to be more than Agumon can handle alone, so Taichi bravely jumps into the fray, endangering himself in the process. The confluence of events here provides Agumon with the ability to evolve into the dragon-like Greymon, who then blasts Shellmon back into the ocean. And then immediately after the fight, Greymon reverts back into Agumon. Here we reach another point of contention for me, and while I admit the show wouldn't work if this wasn't the case, it never really made that much sense to me. I'm talking specifically about the fact that Digimon Adventure is a next-tier power-up state genre, similar to shows like Dragon Ball Z. It's a genre that almost entirely defines itself by having each new threat be averted by heroes powering up, and whenever a new threat is introduced, it's next level, so the heroes discover some next level power or evolution, and then they're able to avert that threat. The same thing happens with the next threat, and the next threat, and so on and so forth. There's always a bigger fish. Digimon Adventure features six stages of evolution. They are Egg, Infant, Baby, Child, Adult, Perfect, and Ultimate. For the most part, the default state for the children's Digimon partners is Child State, and each evolution functions as a power-up state. The fact that the partner Digimon revert back to their child or baby forms clashes with the fact that throughout their journeys, the children encounter many other Digimon who seem to be at a set stage of evolution. In other words, those Digimon don't regress after being weakened or defeated. What's more, the virtual pet never functioned this way. If your Digimon evolved, its new state was permanent, reflecting your treatment of it along the way. Moreover, dialogue from Leomon in episode 13 will make this even more confusing. So while admittedly this is something that's always bothered me about the show, I found it easier to cope with it as being a facet when I consider Digimon evolution as functioning in symbolic representation for how the children mature throughout their journeys. And a prime example here is Taichi's bravely engaging Shalmon alongside Agumon. Although Taichi doesn't realize it at this point in time, He'll later learn that his show of courage is specifically required to trigger Agumon's evolution. Later evolutions will require Taichi to temper that courage and focus it. So, having successfully warded off Shelmon, the children decide to travel elsewhere. Then we move into Episode 3. The children encounter two dinosaurs, Monochromons who happen to be fighting with each other for who knows what reason. A territorial dispute, as Tentomon, Koshiro's Digimon partner, suggests. The intensity of the fighting causes the children to flee deeper into File Island's forests. As they continue into the forest, they encounter a series of random signposts standing amidst the surrounding trees. More man-made technology appearing as a natural facet, as I mentioned before concerning the phone booths. As daylight fades away, the children decide to find somewhere to make camp, and they discover a lake. On an islet within the lake is set a trolley car, and it functions in spite of not being atop any tracks nor visibly connected to any power source. It is decided that the trolley will make for the perfect campsite. Resourcefully, the children and their Digimon partners take this time to forage for more food, such as fruit from the local plant life and fish in the lake. The presence of fish in the lake would run contrary to what Agumon and Tentumon said before about there only being Digimon existing within the digital world. I suppose they're simply mistaken, similar to how Palmon insisted she's capable of photosynthesis, in spite of the fact that she doesn't even know what that is. But there's also this question as to why Koshiro in this instance would need to catch the fish via pole and troll, when Gomamon has the ability to command fish, doesn't he? Shouldn't he be able to tell the fish to just leap out of the water? Anyway, later that night as they dine in their recent hall, Taichi asks Sora about Yamato and Takeru. Specifically, he wants to know why Takeru continually refers to Yamato as Onichan. Onichan means older brother, but it can be used to refer to one's older cousin as well and Taichi assumed as much in the previous episode, since Yamato and Takeru have different last names. However, now it seems that Taichi isn't so sure anymore. Sora says she doesn't know either. Right before they turn in for bed, Taichi tells Gabumon that he wants to use his pelt as a blanket. Taichi is joking, of course, but Yamato doesn't take too kindly to his humor, and ups and shoves him. Both boys look ready to fight until Takeru yells for them to stop, which they do. Later, Yamato will apologize and reveals to Taichi that he and Takeru are related by birth, and that their parents are divorced. He says this in a matter-of-fact tone, but then he runs off before Taichi can respond, 
Yamato is clearly affected by this. This helps explain why Yamato is so overprotective when it comes to Gabumon and Takeru alike, a gesture we also see play out when he tells Gabumon to keep Takeru warm as they fall asleep. Part of Taichi's confusion here about Yamato and Takeru's relationship has to do with how distant Yamato seems. You see, Taichi has a younger sister back at home, and they've been raised together for quite some time. They haven't had to deal with the kind of damage that divorce and separation can do to one's family. Yamato is constantly put into awkward situations when it comes to how he's supposed to relate to Takeru as an older brother, whereas for Taichi, it all seems to come quite naturally. And one sees this play out quite clearly as they have their dinner about the fireplace, and we see two very different responses from both Taichi and Yamato when Takeru asks how to properly eat his fish. Taichi leaves quite an impression on Takeru, slowly becoming like an older brother to him, but this is something that Yamato will come to resent Taichi for as time goes on. One wonders how differently Yamato would be throughout the show if his parents had not been divorced. Perhaps he'd be a lot more like Taichi, and less of a loner. Yamato takes to expressing his melancholy by playing his harmonica, set apart from the rest of the group. There's a quiet moment here as the notes fill the silence, soothing the soul, but is broken quite suddenly when an angry Seedramon attacks them. Yamato follows Taichi's example from the previous episode and attempts to engage Seedramon alongside Gabuon. He actually dives into the lake, risking his life to save Takeru from drowning, and then he tries to save everyone else by leading Seedramon away from the islet. Unfortunately, Seedramon proves too quick for Yamato, and grabs him, threatening to strangle the life out of him. Nevertheless, the confluence of events caused Gabumon to evolve into the wolf-like Garurumon. After an impressive fight, Garurumon manages to drive back Sidramon, saving Yamato in the process. The children are then left to wonder what triggered Gabumon's evolution, and why was Agumon unable to evolve this time when he could in the previous episode. What's unclear here is whether or not the writers tried to maintain some kind of consistency as far as having Digimon evolution rely on very specific traits displayed by each child. For the most part, each Digimon partner experiences a preliminary evolution that remains almost entirely dependent on whether or not their human partner was in danger. The only exceptions being Koshiro and possibly Sora, but I'll address those when I talk about episodes 4 and 5. Here, episode 3 is brought to a satisfying close, and we see firsthand how the lives of the children have changed and will continue to change. Since last night's rest was violently interrupted by Sidramon's attack, the children begin to fall right back asleep, but do so clumped together on the ground alongside their Digimon partners. Their plight has led to their becoming that much more of a tight-knit group, but even in the midst of all the potential dangers of the digital world, Yamato continues to play his harmonica, not alone this time, but now in the accompaniment of his younger brother who loves him.